Good morning! It is the Lord's Day. It's April the 16th of 2022. And our tech 2023. Our text is the day of the Lord. That's our theme. And let me read our text for today from Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. And we are finishing the book of Malachi this week. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, saith the Lord, so that you will leave them neither root nor branch. For you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness, will rise with healing in his wings. You will go out leaping like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, saith the Lord of hosts, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of his fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Well, our theme is the day of the Lord, and I would like to define the day of the Lord. It is the day when Christ appears in judgment and salvation. The first appearance was his birth. The second appearance will be the rapture revelation. Now, I'd like to say a few words about prophecy. I love prophecy. And from the day I was saved, uh, some uh, 50-some years ago, I have read books on prophecy, studied prophecy. Uh, I love prophecy. But let me say this. I also believe in truth. And you may not know what this means, but a couple times when I have been preparing these recordings... My trusty assistant, Fuzzy, has shut it down and looked at me and said, that is not true. And do I appreciate that? Never. But it wasn't true. It was a quote that had been, that I had found that was not correct. And we checked it out because ultimately, whether I like what he does or not, Preaching is to be about truth. And so when I talk about prophecy, I love prophecy, but I like biblical prophecy. Now, if you want to make money and you're a big preacher, the way to make the most money, they say, is to write a book on prophecy. They sell like hotcakes. I do not like speculative prophecy. And here's why. I just, it, it just drives me nuts. It didn't used to. But I've been a Christian since 1970, since I found Christ. I've been studying prophecy since then. You know, that's 53 years ago. And I have seen so many of these preachers come and go, and their speculations come and go. And it bothers me. These guys uh, don't bother me if they get the scripture out and tell what they think it means. But pretty soon, they usually have this contact in Israel who's telling them all these things that are happening. Well, guess what? I have contact in Wisconsin. <laughs> all of you. But I don't know what's happening in the governor's office. I really don't. Even though I read the news... And I get the little fights between Republicans and the Democrats. But I really don't know what's happening in that office. I don't know what. I live in the United States, and I've driven around it. I've even been in the Capitol. But I don't know what's going on in the Defense Department. And some of these guys have some friend because they have some friend, and they tell all this juicy stuff, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's the way it is. Baloney, I've been to Israel just because I know somebody in Israel or just because I know one well-placed official. By the way, if we looked in our country, 
the Secretary of the Interior, or the Secretary of Agriculture, or the Secretary of Transportation. They probably don't even know all the secret things that the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the military know. I mean, it's a big government. To think that they that some preacher over here has connections over there where they know all the inside secrets, that is asinine to believe that. You know, uh, I love people from the military, but there's some of them I've met that irritate me. I mean, they talk about their special clearance, and a lot of military people have special clearance, but that doesn't mean they really got into high uh, clearance areas. But some of them talk like they really know all the inside details, even though they were in the military 15 years ago. I tell you what I've learned People who are in the military that know all the inside stuff don't talk about it. People that talk about it are balonies. You know what baloney is? I grew up in the farm. For some odd reason, the bull market has always been high. When you sell your bull, they bring a good price. You know why? Because it's old meat, it's tough meat, and they can take that carcass and take a 1,500 pounds of meat, they grind it up, and then they take it and make sausages, and they put corn in it and other fillers, and then they pump her full of water, and they can take 1,500 pounds of meat and sell 3,000 pounds of product. That's why they call it baloney. And when people say that's baloney, that means someone's taking a little bit of truth and making a whole lot out of it. I ain't going to be one of them preachers. And people come to me all the time with, oh, I heard this, I heard that, and I say, baloney. I don't know when the Lord is coming back. I don't know all the inside secrets of Israel and Egypt and Iran. I don't know that, and I'll be honest, there ain't any other preacher in the United States that knows much more than I do. They may know a little bit. I don't know when the courts of heaven and God is going to send his angels down and do it. I just read the word. So today, that's what you're going to get. The first picture I see in the day of the Lord that Malachi shares, remember each prophet shares a little different picture, is he pictures a violent oven. And when we think of a violent oven, let's think of God and his person. You know, in Ezekiel 127, the whole Ezekiel 1 is Ezekiel's vision of God and the wheel and the sea of glass. And, and, and in verse 27 he says, he had the appearance of his waist, I saw if it was gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire all around it. And downward from the appearance of his waist, I saw the appearance of fire with brightness around it. Deuteronomy 4.24 says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a judging God. Now, who is this consuming fire coming to? To the evildoers. Well, that's everybody in a way. All of us have done some evil. But it also mentions the arrogant. Who are the arrogant? There's the ones who can't say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. Come into my heart and be my savior. They think they're going to save themselves or save the planet from global warming or whatever. And they don't trust God. And then what's he going to do? This, he'll be a fire. He says he's going to set it ablaze. Now there's temporal fire and there's eternal fire. Temporal fire sets things straight. Okay, temporal fire sets things straight. But eternal fire is different than temporal fire. In Mark 9, 43 through 48, the scripture says, If your hand caused you to sin, cut it off. Better to enter life crippled than to go two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. 
If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Better to anger the kingdom of God with one eye than two eyes to be thrown in hell. And where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The fires of hell are a fire that consumes and yet does not consume. You do not die. You just keep burning. The next thing we see is they will be extinguished like stubble. And if the field is uh, combined and the stubble is there and it catches fire that's dry, it will just burn like crazy. And then this fire will be so deep, it will eliminate the influence of branch and root. You know, it's interesting. When I lived in Montana, there, there was a big dispute over the Forest Service and their ideas. And you know, it's interesting when you have a forest fire, uh, during that time they had the let it burn idea. And there's some truth to that, because if you let it burn, uh, there are pine cones buried in the dirt, and until the heat comes and breaks the pine cone with the heat, then you get the new forest. And so it takes a certain amount of heat. And so they were, the a government was pushing the let it burn policy to bring new forest up. And I remember when this was a little bit of debate, I was at a garage sale or something, and one old timer says, look up there on the mountain, that burnt when I was a little boy, and there's nothing there. And that's because it all depends on how hot the fire is and how fast it moves. Typically, a fast-moving fire will burn through, break the pine cones up, the seeds come up, and it's a good thing. But if it's a hot enough fire where it consumes everything, nothing comes up for a long, maybe a, one or two centuries. And this will be the kind of fire that eliminates branch and root. Fire is a cleansing agent. Back in the day when they had no way to cleanse from the plague and various things, sometimes they'd burn houses down. They'd burn bedding. They just burnt everything because fire is a cleansing agent. And I feel in our day, one of the issues we have is a minimization of hellfire. So many people say, well, hell is separation from God. That's all it is. You're just in darkness. You can't get to God and you're frustrated. That's not the teaching of Jesus. The teaching of Jesus was that hell was eternal punishment and the fire that don't go out. The second picture we have is a vigor in Jesus, health in Christ, spiritual, physical, and emotional it says the son of righteousness will rise. And this son of righteousness is not the S-U-N, but the son like the son that is our source of health. Righteousness is purity, wholesomeness, inner peace, and confidence. This sun shine that warms upon us, and we've had some beautiful sunshine this week. The sunshine of Jesus is righteousness, which is pure, wholesome, and gives us confidence. And this sunshine, when it rises, is healing in its wings. Sometimes people that are sick need to sit in the sun. So we are healed through the resurrection when our bodies are healed. But we are healed from the atmosphere because the atmosphere of the earth has pollutants, has sin, and it has society with its effects. And when the Son of Righteousness comes with healing in his wings, and we're changed in a moment of a twinkle of an eye, we'll be in heaven and we'll be healed. Now, when we talk about his wings, we talk about the wings of God. In Psalm 17, 8, it says, Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. In Psalm 94 or 91.4 says, He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Jesus, when he was coming on Palm Sunday, and he wept for the city of Jerusalem, he said, 
how God wanted to gather the people as a hen gathers its chicks under its wings. And that reminds me of that old song, Under his wings, under his wings, who from my soul can sever? Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Beautiful, beautiful song. Now the next thing we find in the scripture is victory. God says, in that day I will act. And everybody gets all wound up about when the Lord is coming, but it's happening and on that day he will act and not until. All the speculation of all these radio and TV preachers and guys who write books won't change one thing because God knows the day and the hour and on that day that he acts. And that should give us assurance that we know that our God is going to act. And it says on the day that he acts, we will tread down the wicked and their ashes will be on the bottom of our shoes on that day. That's how great the victory will be. Are you ever frustrated with the government? Are you ever frustrated with uh, all that goes on in the world? I know a lot of people have been out there this week uh, shooting beer cans. Well, that's not a problem for me because I don't drink anyway. But boy, people are upset. Because there is this sense that businesses and the government are trying to push a morality on us we don't want. And we can't win. It seems like the whole world's against anybody that has any kind of morals. But there's going to be a day when we will win. And that day is described as leaping like calves out of the stall. You know what? I I got two pair of glasses here. I uh, <laughs> that's interesting. It gives you something to think about. Uh, I look forward when I was a boy to the spring when we would turn the calves out of the barn. They had been in the barn and they were happy in there. But boy, when they get out and they get sunshine and green grass and space. They would run and throw their tails in the air and kick, and they would just go crazy for a while. Even the big cows and the bull and everybody would do it. In fact, you had to be a little bit careful about having, when you opened the barn door, you knew where which path you want to go in because they might get away. They're kind of crazy for a while. That's how we'll feel. The joy and the fulfillment and the freedom. And I want you to know, this is what God wants you to know. You don't need to know when. You don't need to know all the details that all these preachers, or they think they know something, they don't know anything. I don't know anything. I just know it will happen, and I need to have faith, and I need to have mercy upon lost sinners. Now, the fourth thing that God says to the people is to validate the law. He says, remember the law of my servant Moses. Of course, this is Old Testament. The statutes and rules I commanded him at Horeb for all of Israel. Well, wait a minute. Aren't we free from the law? Oh, happy condition, the song says. Well, let's think about the law. When we think about the law of God, there is first the civil law. And the civil law is the law of the land. Very similar to what we have, that, and we're supposed to obey it. We're told to obey the law of the land. Then we have the ceremonial law, which is the law governing the temple. And every aspect of that ceremonial law portrayed the nature of God and all the details of redemption and the temple. And here's what I have to say about all that stuff in the Old Testament they did. It fulfilled in the once for all sacrifice of Christ, so it never had to be done again. So the ceremonial law is out the door because Jesus fulfilled it. 
Then we have the moral law, the Ten Commandments. The first four are about a relationship with God. The last six about our relationship with humanity. There is one change to the Ten Commandments from the Old to New Testament. In the Old Testament it said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And the Sabbath was a day of creation, a day of rest and worship. In the New Testament, we remember the Lord's Day. And by the way, in New Testament history, until this last liberated generation that we're in now, pretty much Christians kept the Sabbath as the Old Testament people did the Lord's Day. It's a day of rest, and it's a day of celebrating that Jesus has risen from the dead. But consider the law. Okay, let's look at the other three of the first commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Is that for today? <clears throat> Thou shalt not have a graven image. Is that for today? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Is that for today? And then let's think of the laws of our neighbors. Honor our father and mother. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. Are those things Christians don't need to be concerned about? No, I think that's something that Christians do need to be concerned about. So to you, I would say, consider the law. Then the last thing we find in this prophecy is the voice in the wilderness. He said, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the day of the Lord comes. Well, I think they're talking about John the Baptist. And here's what it says. He will turn the hearts. What did John the Baptist do? He went out and said, repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. And there was relational repentance because the fathers, <coughs> suddenly when they came to the Lord and got their hearts right, they got concerned about their children's eternal life. And the children got concerned about living up to their family Christian heritage. But this was about saving the land. And this is what I don't understand. And I've never saw this before. This is a new, in verse 6, a new twist on John the Baptist. It says here, Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So here's what I think it's saying. I think God is saying, if I hadn't sent John the Baptist to get some people's hearts right so that they could respond to Jesus when he came. If there had been no response to Jesus, I would have destroyed the land. But Israel did respond to Jesus. Many were saved. And the many were saved because of the ministry of John the Baptist. And that's why he sent John, is to prepare the way. We often forget how much was the way prepared. Well, we know that uh, Paul <clears throat> ministered with Apollos, who was a uh, disciple of John the Baptist, and he came to Christ. We know that one day Paul met 10 <coughs> disciples of John the Baptist. They were all saved. Some of the disciples were also disciples of John the Baptist. Many, many people, their hearts were prepared for the coming of Christ. Well, <clears throat> here is my conclusion to this sermon. Romans 8, 37. Know in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What does that mean? <clears throat> Paul, I mean, God, wanted the people in Malachi's day who had gotten discouraged and felt like God hadn't done anything, 
that God should have stopped all the immorality and all the injustice, that God should have done something with the world. He wanted them to know <clears throat> that he was going to do that. And he wanted them to know that it would be a complete victory. And he wanted them to know that even if it hasn't come today, we need to feel like conquerors in this world instead of losers. Because we are following the King of kings and Lord of lords. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, bless our people today and give them a sense of victory and winning. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.